Hi, so we had some technical difficulties, okay? Our car, our car battery, our uh, camera battery went down a little bit. So uh, we're pretty sure we know where we ended up. Um, so I'm sorry about that. All right, so we were talking about Europe and how, um, as I mentioned before, that red stamp and the grandmother really, um, they're relics of an old time, right, of the good old days. Um, but this is 1950s. World War II is over. And as I mentioned before, what, what do you feel could have happened in Europe, especially with minorities, think African American or Latinos, um, soldiers, what did they see in Europe, how were they treated in Europe, and what happened when they came back, and how were they treated when they came back, okay, so think about that, because I'm pretty sure that's what the grandmother says when it's Europe's fault, all right, um, look at the, okay, this is where the funny things begin, I'm sorry if I start randomly cracking up, but this is really funny, the next paragraph, the one that starts off with they drove off, Outside of Tombsboro, she woke up the grandmother and recalled an old plantation she had visited in this neighborhood once when she was a young lady. She said the house had seven white columns across the front and there was an avenue of oaks leading up to it and two little wooden trillies are burst on either side of the front where you sat down with your suitor after a stroll in the garden. She recalled exactly which road to turn off to get to it. She knew that Bailey would not be willing to lose any time looking for an old house, but the more she talked about it, the more she really wanted to see it once again and find out if the little twin arbors were still standing. There was a secret panel in the house, she said craftily, not telling the truth, but wishing it were. And this, the story went, family silver was hidden in it when Sherman came through, but it was never found. Okay, so that's a great story, right? There's hidden treasure in this house. The kids are going to love it. Kids hear that, and like, we want to go. And man, these kids really, really, you know, we, we want to go. And June Star says to the next page, we've never seen a house with a secret panel. Let's go to the house. We want to go to the house. Okay, so this goes on forever. Okay, the children began to yell and scream that they wanted to see the house with the secret panel. John Wesley kicked the back of the front seat. June Star hung her hung over her mother's shoulder, and White desperately interfered that they never had fun on their vacations, that they never wanted to do what they that they never did what they wanted to do, and the baby began to scream. Okay, this is why road trips are bad sometimes, okay? I said the the one big road trip I took with my family, the only one I didn't want to leave behind at a breast stop was the dog. Because one of the dogs traveled with us. Everybody else, I was ready to leave at a rest stop. I shouldn't say that because my husband's behind there. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have left you, Joe. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, okay, so the kids are annoying as a incredibly annoying little kids. Okay, as I said, our kids are want to do. All right, so, all right, Bailey shouted and drew the car to a stop at the side of the road. Will you shut up? Will you all shut up for one second? If you don't shut up, we're not going anywhere. It would be very educational to them, for them. Yes, going to a plantation is very educational, right? Yeah, it actually is. All right, Bailey said, but get this. This is the only time we're going to stop for anything like this. It's the one and only time. The dirt road that you have to turn about is about a mile back, the grandmother directed. I marked it when we passed it. A dirt road. All right, all right, dirt road. Okay. It's the 2780, so they're driving down this dirt road, okay. It's not much further, the grandmother said, and just as she said it, a horrible thought came over to her. The thought was so embarrassing that she turned red in the face and her eyes dilated and her feet jumped up, upsetting the valise at the corner. The instant the valise moved, the newspaper top she had over the basket under it rose with a snarl and pity seeing the cat sprang onto Bailey's shoulder. <laughs> the children were thrown to the floor and their mother, clutching the baby, was thrown out the door to the ground. The old lady was thrown into the front seat. The car turned over once, landed right side up with the gulch at the side of the road. Bailey remained in the driver's seat with the cat, a stripe, gray stripe with a broad white face and an orange nose clinging to his neck like a caterpillar. As soon as the children saw that they could move their arms and legs, they scrambled out of the car shouting, we've had an accident. The grandmother was curled up under the dashboard, hoping that she was injured so that Bailey's wrath would not come down on her all at once. The horrible thought that she had had before the accident was that the house she remembered so vividly was not in Georgia, but in Tennessee. <laughs> oh, that's funny. 
okay, I'm trying not to laugh. That, that's hilarious, right? I mean, that's the accident. And she's like, oh crap, I forgot. Bailey removed the cat from his neck with both hands and flung it out the window against the side of pe the side of the pine tree. Now, honestly, was that necessary? Was that very necessary? Then he got out of the car and started looking for the children's mother. She was sitting against the side of the red leaded ditch holding a screaming baby, but she had only a cut down her face and a broken shoulder. We had an accident. The children screamed with frenzied delight. But no one's killed, June Star said with disappointment at the grandmother lived out of the car. Okay, this is very dark. Hey, yes, of course, an accident is serious. I mean, obviously, these kids were not in car seats. The fact that they're alive is, is a miracle that the mom only broke a shoulder. Oh, that's a small miracle as well, but that's that's humor. Yes, the humor that they had that the kids sad because the grandma survived. I believe I have or I have injured an organ, the grandmother said, pressing her side, but no one answered her. Bailey's teeth were chat were clattering. He had an, he had on a yellow sport shirt with bright blue parrots designed on it, and his face was as yellow as the shirt. The grandmother decided that she would not mention that the house was in Tennessee. 2782. So they've had this accident. They're stuck on the side of the road. Okay, the driver gets out of a car. The grandmother had the peculiar feeling that the speckled man was someone she knew. His face was familiar to her, as if she had known him all her life, but she could not recall who he was. He moved away from the car and began to come down the embankment, placing his feet carefully so that he wouldn't slip. He had on a he had on tan white and he had on tan or white shoes and no socks, and his ankles were red and thin. Good afternoon, he said. I see you all had a little spill. We turned over twice, said the grandmother. Once, he corrected. We seen it happen. Try their car and see if it'll run, Hiram. What do you have a gun for, John Wesley asked. What are you going to do with that gun? Ladies, the man said to the children's mother, would you mind calling them children to sit by you? Children make me nervous. I want all of you to sit right down and there where you're at. Why are you telling us what, 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 what are you telling us what we, what, I'm sorry, what are you telling us what to do for, June Star said. Behind them, the line of woods gave like a dark, open mouth. Come here, the, said the mother. Look here, Bailey said suddenly, we're in a predicament. Okay, we're in a, we're in a the grandmother shrieked as she scrambled to her feet and stood staring. You're the misfit, she said. I recognized you at once. Yes, ma'am, the man said, smiling slightly as he was, if he were pleased in spite of himself to be known. But it would have been better for all of you, lady, if you hadn't recognized me. All right, so we have a lot to, to, to um, talk about right there. The hour found, um, as it was foreshadowed at the beginning, right, by the misfit and his two accomplices. Um, the misfit's got a gun. They're trapped there, and unfortunately, the misfit knows who they are. This is not a good situation. Why, definitely not a good situation. Bailey turned his head sharply and said something to his mother that shocked even the children. The old lady began to cry and the misfit reddened. Lady, don't you get upset. Sometimes a man said things he don't mean. I don't reckon he meant to talk to you that way. You wouldn't shoot a lady, would you, the grandmother said, and removed a pink handkerchief from her cup and began to slap at her eyes with it. The misfit point pointed to the toe of his shoe into the ground and made a little hole and covered it up again. I would I would hate to have to, he said. Listen, the grandmother almost screamed. I know you're a good man. You don't look a bit like you have common blood. I know you come from nice people. Okay, so I you don't look a bit like you have common blood. Okay again. Hierarchy is very important here with right the social hierarchy that it's important that he comes from a good family, that he is a nice man, right? Okay, and the grandmother keeps saying this over and over again, right? You're a good person. You would never shoot me. And he's tr she's trying to make him be a moral person, even though he's not necessarily agreeing to it, right? He responds, yes, ma'am. He said, finest people in the world. God never made a finer woman than my mother, and my daddy's heart was pure gold, he said. All right, so he is... According to the grandmother, a good man, right? I mean, he comes from good stock. Okay. Let's go to 27. Let me see if I want to see another one. All right, the bottom of 2783. 
I mentioned that the Southern Gothic has has horror in there in it and it does and it actually has terror as well and you all remember horror and terror remember horror is your hair, horror gets in your head terror doesn't okay so if you remember that horror gets in your head look at this at the very bottom 2783 and my grandmother still keeps saying this i know you're a good man she said dis desperately you're not a bit common and this is after bailey and his little boy got sent off to the woods with the two accomplices okay you know this is not going to end well because they have guns no ma'am i ain't a good man the misfit said after a second as if he considered her, her statement carefully but i ain't the worst in the world neither my daddy said I was a different breed of dog from my brothers and sisters. You know, daddy said, it's some that can live their whole life without asking about it. And it, it's others that has to know why it is. And this boy is one of the latter. He's going to be into everything. Okay, let's go to the next one right here. I'm sorry, I don't have a shirt before you ladies. He said, clutching his shoulders slightly. We buried our clothes that we had on when we escaped and we're making do until we can get better we borrowed these from folks we met he explained all right so a couple of things here number one he says he's not a good person he's not a good man right because remember what makes a good man it's um his lineage his education where he lives okay another one are his manners Okay. And he says that he says to them between this weird, very horrific scene where we know that um, Bailey and John probably aren't going to live. Okay, it's very horrific because you know something's happening. Okay, so the terror is going to come in. He says to them, "I'm sorry, I don't have a shirt on." Okay, that's something that someone with very good manners who's been raised well, what the grandma says, right? A good man. Um, that's something they would say. Okay, so that comes out in them. So according to what the grandma says, he's a good person right now. Let's continue on. That's perfectly all right, the grandmother said. Maybe Bailey has an extra in his suitcase. All right, scroll, scroll sorry, go down to um, the pistol shot. There was a pistol shot from the woods followed closely by another, then silence. Okay. Um, if you are going to pay attention now, you are right because this is horrific. Two people were just murdered. Okay, but you notice this murder, this murder takes place outside of our view, and it's sort of being told like very underhandedly. Okay. The old lady's head jerked around. She could hear the wind move through the treetops like a long sigh, satisfied. It's like a breath. Bailey boy, she called. I was a gospel singer for a while, the misfit said. I've been most everything. Been in the armed service, both land and sea, at home and abroad. Been twice married, been an undertaker, been with the railroads, plot of Mother Earth, been in a tornado. Seen a man burned alive once. There's your lynching. Okay. Seen a man burned alive once. I even saw a woman flogged. Okay, so this is the very essence of violence in the South. Okay, we had we talked about the violence, especially the last time with the, the poem titled The Lynching. Okay, he makes reference to it. He's like, yeah, I've seen all this. I've seen all this violence. Pray, pray, the grandmother began. Pray. I never was a bad boy that I remember of, but somewhere along the line, I done something wrong and got sent to the penitentiary. I was buried alive. Okay, do you all know what he did? Because they don't tell you exactly what he said. Do you guys know what he did? Right here. Top 24. I mean, they, they, they mention what he says, but I'm wondering if y'all caught on to it. The, pack, the top of 27.85. The misfit sneered slightly. Nobody had done... No, nobody had nothing I wanted. It was a head doctor at the penitentiary said I had done kill my daddy, but I know that for a lie. My daddy died in 1909, 1919 of this epidemic flu, and I never had a thing to do with it. Okay, so he probably killed his dad. There you go. If you would pray, the old lady said, Jesus would help you. That's right. Well, then why don't you pray? I don't want any help. I'm doing all right by myself. Okay, so again, remember... Good manners, he apologizes, seems like a good person, comes from good stock, right? What does he say? Uh, that God ever made a finer woman like my than my mother. My daddy, my daddy's heart was pure gold. Okay, is he a good person? Of course he's not. 
Bobby Lee and Hiram came ambling back from the woods. Bobby Lee was dragging a yellow shirt with bright blue parrots on it. Throw me that shirt, Bobby Lee said. I'm sorry, throw me this shirt, Bobby Lee, the, mis the misfit said. The shirt came flying at him, landed in his shoulder, and he put it on. The grandmother couldn't name what the shirt reminded her of. Okay, this is stark horror. She is scared with, out of her wits. Okay, this is scary. We can maybe place, place ourselves in this situation when everything is going wrong, and you think you're going to act a certain way, right? Because we all think, oh, we're going to... Be, um, if somebody ever pulls a gun on us, we're going to attack. This is her reacting normally. Okay, psychologists, psychiatrists, trauma experts will tell you this is how a lot of people act. Okay, they, they're in this horrific situation and they freeze. And the lady's frozen, right? The grandmother couldn't name what the shirt reminded her of. Well, who was wearing her shirt? This The shirt was wearing, being worn by her son, okay? O'Connor makes it clear that this shirt, the bright yellow with the blue um, parrots was being worn by Bailey and now he has it. Okay. The children's mother had begun to make heaving noises after she couldn't catch her breath. Okay. Again, we forget about this lady. Okay, but she's there. Lady, he asked, would you and that little girl like to step off yonder with Bobby Lee and Hiram and join your husband? Yes, thank you, the mother said faintly. Right? That's no shock. She's, they're taking the, the two children and the mother away. What do you think is going to happen to them? Okay? Along with the misfit, the grandmother had found her, how, had found that she had lost her voice. Okay? This is a woman who had who talked and talked and talked right at the beginning. Okay? Even the kids say that. Okay? That, they, she, that uh, she talks a lot and she, she feels she's very important. Okay? But here, she found that she had lost her voice. The very one, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus will help you. But the way she was saying it, it sounded like she might be cursing. Yes, ma'am, the misfit said, if you agree, Jesus storm everything off balance. Okay, and then you have this um, conversation that they have, right, about Jesus and about Jesus um, raising Lazarus from the dead. Interesting that we're reading it around this time. Um, I didn't plan it, by the way. Okay, um, and they're having this conversation about morality and Jesus can help him and he's saying no I don't want to be helped okay um I want y'all to see 2786 the the old lady says Jesus the old lady cried you've got good blood I know you wouldn't shoot a lady I know you come from nice people pray Jesus you ought not shoot a lady I'll give you all the money I've got Right. So she's back and she's telling, she's saying the same thing to him, right? You've got good blood. And it's starting to dawn on her that maybe these ideas that she had, these ideas that still come from the antebellum south over, maybe they're not very good ideas. Maybe someone from good blood, okay, is not a good man. Okay, so they have this back and forth um, theological conversation about Jesus, okay? Forget the hierarchy at this point. It's just the two of them together. Hiram and Bobby Lee are off, okay, shooting uh, the mother and the, the, um, the mother, the daughter, and the little boy. And we have, let's see, 85, okay? And um, they, they are shot as well. Okay, we know that they, they were shot as well. And like I said, there's a theological conversation going right here. And if you look at 2786, there is a change here with the grandmother. Okay, there's a change right here. She saw the man's twisted face twisted close to her own as if he was going to cry as she murmured, why, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. She reached out and touched him on the shoulder. The misfit sprang back as if the snake had bit him and shot her three times through the chest. Then he put his gun on the ground, took off his glasses, and began to clean them. Hiram and Bobby Lee returned from the woods and stood over the ditch, looking down at the grandmother who sat, who half sat halfway in a puddle of blood with her legs crossed under her hair like a child's, and her face smiling up at the cloudless sky. Why is it that you all feel that we see her death, but we only hear the death of the, of uh, Bailey, the his wife, and the children? Why do you feel that? Because O'Connor could have taken us to the woods and seen us, um, and seen them killed. Why do we only see the grandmother? What does that death mean 
for um, the ideals of the antebellum south of the good old days. Okay, think about that. Think of what O'Connor is trying to tell us. She was a talker, wasn't she, Bobby Lee said, sliding down the ditch with a yodel. She would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been someone there to shoot her every minute of her life. Some fun, Bobby Lee said. Shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said. It's no real pleasure in life. And I love Bobby, by the way, that the misfit gets the cat and is, is going to take the cat and the cat actually survives. Um, but yeah, that's the end of the story. A um, couple of things I want you all to keep in mind. Why is the grandmother's death scene? Okay. Why is it that suddenly people coming back from Europe come back changed and are causing this uh, sea change in the south? Um, was, mi mis was the misfit a good man? Okay, Did they find a good man? And if they did, it blew up in their faces horribly, didn't it? Okay, So that's a few things I want you to see want you to know about this story. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, as I said, the stark horror and terror at the end, I mean, that absolute violence that hammers at you, um, it's there. Okay, and this is, like I said, this is one of the stories that people talk about when they talk about the Southern Gothic. This is the story they talk about. Um, so go over this. I'm expecting a new discussion soon. I am grading as fast as I can, so please bear with me, okay, because I've got two other jobs and two kids to homeschool. But you guys are definitely my priority. As I said, I do miss you all. So um, keep keep up the good work. And I will see you guys with Sylvia Plath tomorrow. Okay, have a good night.